<laughs> this now is the 24th uh, study period of our camp meeting here in British Columbia in 1984. This is the Wednesday afternoon study at 3 o'clock, the 29th of August. Now, as I promised, we'd spend this study period in answering questions. I so far have only five, and uh, that might be enough anyway for this period, but if anybody else has more questions, don't be afraid to write them out and pass them up, and we'll do our best to answer them. I'll take them in the order in which they're given to me. The first question is, why isn't the tribe of Dan mentioned in Revelation? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 7, for the actual scripture under consideration. And uh, then we'll consider some, imp some quick points in regard to um, this uh, question. Now you'll notice that between verses 1 and verse 8 we have the 12 tribes of Israel listed as follows. Well actually between verses 4, the verse 5 and verse 8. And I'll just name the tribes without reading the whole verse. Judah, Reuben, Gad... Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph and Benjamin. And if, you'd like, if, you, if you take the trouble to count them, of course, you find there are exactly 12 tribes involved. Now, <clears throat> type must meet antitype, and the answer to this question lies in the study of the typical Old Testament uh, services and the disposition of the 12 tribes involved back there. The actual fact is, of course, there were 13 tribes which crossed the River Jordan and they were, and they included, of course, uh, the tribe of Levi, which was the 13th, but the unnumbered tribe in the encampment. In the actual disposition of those tribes, they were laid out as follows. First of all, in the center of the camp was the tabernacle and the tribe of Levi pitched their tents immediately around that sacred building. Then there were three tribes to the north, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the south, and three tribes to the west, making a total, of course, of 13 tribes altogether. The 12 uh, tribes in the outer circle were all numbered tribes, and the, but the tribe of Levi was unnumbered. And uh, when the declaration was made by God that uh, none of those over 20 should enter the promised land who had came to Spani the first time that uh, was of those who were numbered as you'll read back in Numbers chapter 14 the unnumbered tribe of Levi was not included and quite a number of Levites no doubt passed into the land of Canaan who were um, over 20 at the time of Kadesh Barnea now <clears throat> If there were 13 tribes which crossed the River Jordan and entered the Promised Land in the Old Testament situation, how many tribes must enter in the New Testament situation? Again, 13, because type must meet antitype. Now, there was one unnumbered tribe in the Old Testament, namely Levi. How many unnumbered tribes must there be in the New Testament? One, and it's Dan. Levi, you'll notice, of course, is listed now in the Amongst the numbered tribes, uh, the verse was verse 7, of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000, the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. Now why, the question now arises, why the change from uh, Levi to Dan? Or at least, why the at least why the change from Levi? Why doesn't Levi continue to be the unnumbered tribe? for the very, very simple reason that there has been a change in the priesthood. Now, there, there are altogether three different priesthood periods in human history, or in eternal history. The first one was the patriarchal system between Adam and Jacob, Jacob being the last of the uh, king priests to reign upon this earth before the office of king was separated from the office of priesthood. And... Um, there was a patriarchal system and in that system the eldest son of every household became the priest unless some special circumstances intervened. And of course the patriarchal head, namely those men that you find listed in the sixth chapter, of, no, uh, about the third or fourth chapter of Genesis, I've just forgotten which it is now, they became the, um, 
the actual overall kings of the church and the main high priest of the church as well. But, and that man had to be the firstborn son of his father's household in turn. But when at Mount Sinai we find that the Levites were faithful to God in the rejection of the worship of the golden calf and the firstborn of the land were not faithful, then God took the priesthood from the firstborn and gave it to the tribe of Levi and they became the priest class or the priest tribe of the land of Israel right down until the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There was a second era and um, then the third era is from the return or the completion of Christ's ministry in the most holy place so that the remainder of eternity when the, Melch when the Melchizedek priesthood comes into operation. <clears throat> so the tribe of Levi being a, of limited typical application pointing to the ministry of Christ between his ascension and his second and the close of probation could not be the unnumbered tribe entering into the heavenly Canaan. Some other tribe must be in that number and for some reason they are not known to us, at least not known to me, Dan is that particular tribe. And um, inasmuch as the special priest class who enter, enter the kingdom of heaven will be the 144,000, we believe that Dan therefore is made up of the 144,000. And because the 144,000 are the first fruits we literally find ourselves returning to the situation where the, where the firstborn again becomes the high priest in God's church. Now I'm going to, I, I did say I would take these questions in their order, but inasmuch as the second questioner is asking questions about the 144,000, I will now switch to them and deal with all the 144,000 questions um, at the same time. Then, then I'll go to the other questions on the first sheet again. The next question is, the 144,000, are they a literal or a symbolic number? Very common question this one is. People often ask this. Most of you, of course, have heard my answer on which has not changed to any degree. Now, it's my firm conviction that the 144,000 are a symbolic number. It's, it's, or is a symbolic number. It, uh, and for the following reasons. First of all, the 144,000 are the wise virgins. That is beyond any shadow of doubt or question. And um, we have uh, another reference to them, the wise virgins, in Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew 25, how many in number are the wise virgins? Five, right? Five in number. So in one place, they're five in number. In the other place, they're 144,000 in number. So we have two different numerical values. Now we're perfectly well aware of course that the number five is not a literal number. Will there be exactly five wise virgins? No. I should hope not. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would be a pathetic harvest, wouldn't it? It'd be so poor that uh, only five people would be living when Jesus Christ comes again. That's a very, very poor harvest. We know that uh, that number five is not a literal number, nor is it a proportional number. Are they 50% wise and 50% foolish? No. In fact, which of the two classes by far the greater proportion of the virgins? The foolish. In 1844, it was almost 50,000 to 100. 40, should we say 49,900 to 100, which of course is a tremendous disparity. So that um, as surely then as the five or well, the designation of this company is five wise virgins is not numerical nor proportional. This leads us to believe that the one point of thousand is not a literal number nor even a proportional number, but rather a very symbolic number. Now when all said and done, what value would there be in God giving to us the literal count of the last uh, body of redeemed? There's no spiritual value in that. There's no worth in that to us in our fight with the man of sin. The number 144,000, of course, is made up of the following numerical values. First of all, 144,000 is the square of 12. 12 by 12 is 144,000. There will be 12 tribes in the Old Testament and 12 apostles in the New. And the four square city New Jerusalem has the names of the apostles in the foundations and the names of the, of the tribes in the gates of the city. And the square, of course, is a, a fairly 
Well, it's a, it's a rather perfect uh, defensive uh, and offensive formation in an army. In the old days, the English always drew up a square to meet their opponents so that they were able to withstand an attack against them. And the, the 10 value in the um, 144,000 is 144,000, not just 144, of course, is multiplied grace because number 5 is a symbol of grace in the Word of God. So the 144,000 is a very symbolic number, a number of perfection and of completion of multiplied grace and infinite power. Now furthermore, the counterpart to 144,000 is 666, a number which is affixed to those who, who choose to remain in eternal bondage and who, uh, who don't desire to accept the grace of God. And we know perfectly well, of course, that 666 is not a literal number, nor a proportional number, but a very symbolic number. You've heard my study on this in the past, of course, uh, number six being a number of man, and every probationary period given to man is a multiple of six. Noah, preached, Noah lived for 600 years before the flood. He preached for 120 years before the flood, and the flood was 1656 years after, after creation, every one, of, every one of those numbers being a multiple of a number six. And um, in, in Genesis, no, in Exodus 22, uh, 21 rather, there is a, uh, a ceremonial uh, requirement that God made there that uh, a slave could be kept in bondage for only six years and in the six years he was given his freedom which he could take or leave as he chose. And likewise, there'll be exactly 6,000 years of sin in this world before the, before the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's made plain in three statements in the book Great Controversy. So that in Noah's day, men made their first choice to accept the symbol of slavery, the mark, uh, which was the boring through the year in, in the symbolic service. In Christ, that a second choice was made and gave that, that group the number 66. Six. And in the last days, when the Holy Spirit shall minister to mankind, the complete number will be made up of 666. Six, six. So it's purely symbolic. Now if the number attached to Satan's army is symbolic in every sense of the word and easily proves so, what must, the, must, what must the counterpart be in God's army, namely the 144,000? It must also be a symbolic number, very much so. Now we are not told, nor do we need to be told, because not for us to number Israel, how many shall be saved in the final count. It could be more than 144,000, it could be a lot less. Whatever it will be, it will be sufficient to finish the work and uh, bring about the end of sin and rebellion and to usher in the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. Now I know there's a statement in, uh, well there are two statements in fact, that, well one statement in particular in the book of the writing which says the one forty four thousand in number and folk without thinking twice about that conclude that that means that they will be a literal number at that point of time. Page 15 in the Book of Holy Writings, the living saints, one forty four thousand in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. Now, does this expression in number mean a numerical count or in symbolic designation? I believe firmly it means in symbolic designation and not in numerical count. But, let me stress the point, of course, I would never get into a hot debate about this question, because Sister Wise says, Numbering the 144,000 is not for us to do. Our task is to ensure that we get in amongst them and understand their mission, their responsibilities and the qualifications necessary to achieve. Membership in that group is by far the more important question in regard to this. Perhaps I should have just simply said let's not even worry about whether it's literal or, literal or, literal or symbolic and worry about what um, the work of the 144,000 is. The next question is, and you, you're well welcome to ask me further questions on these at the end of the study period if you wish, if I haven't covered it properly. Next question is, who is the great multitude since most of the foolish virgins who come in during the loud cry leave us again? Revelation 7 is um, a, a very interesting chapter. First of all, it talks about the sealing work in verses 1, 2 and 3. Then verse 5 to uh, verse 4, Four is five to eight. Uh, talk about the sealing of twelve thousand members of each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, of course, these are not literal tribes, but they're symbolic. You don't have to have Jewish blood in your veins to be a member of one of these tribes. You can have Red Indian blood or American or Australian blood, anything you like. 
what does matter is that your character qualification is such that you, that you qualify to be in one of those tribes so that when Christ comes again you can find salvation in his kingdom. Now, first of all, John hears a number of them which are sealed and there's 12,000 altogether, broken down into 12,000, I mean 144,000 altogether in verse 4, broken down into 12,000 from each of 12 tribes. Now, no sooner does he see this sealing work completed then he looks and behold a great multitude, verse 9, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And it goes on down to the rest of the chapter to talk about their various factors about them. Since we studied the seven angels, this becomes even more easier to understand. Now the questioner uh, is, uh, what shall I say, uh, giving evidence of uh, leaning toward the popular view that the 144,000 are first of all sealed from the Adventist church and they go out there and gather in the great multitude during the loud cry period. And both the 144,000 and the great multitude together go through the time of trouble. However, in a very careful study of all the spirit prophecy references or, or statements on this chapter 7 of, great, of, of Revelation makes it very plain that in every single instance Sister White looked upon the great multitude as the saved of all ages from Adam's time to the end. Now, <clears throat> that great multitude at the present time is lying locked in their tombs and they cannot be released from there until what has happened no, the first fruits have done their work. The fifth and sixth angels, fifth, fifth and sixth angels, well, even the fifth, sixth, and seventh angels have all done their work, and the stealing of the one for the thousand has been finally completed, and they are their work is done. So, isn't it isn't it appropriate then that John should first of all see the one for the thousand, full and complete, their work done, and immediately after there appears the great multitude? That's that's the natural proper relationship the proper sequence in the whole drama. And as I said, of course, this is supported by the fact that uh, the spirit of prophecy uh, refers to the great multitude as the redeemed of all ages. I once had, a, had a, uh, a carefully compiled collection of statements on that, which I don't have with me at this point. I didn't expect to answer that question on this trip. It's, been, it's a long time since it's been asked, as a matter of fact. Now, let me turn to Great Controversy there for one of those statements. Um, I can find it here quite readily in the, it's on page 665. And this is a rather special order or assembly of the redeemed at the end of the thousand years. Thank you. At the end of the thousand years, um, um, as the wicked look upon the redeemed and, and, and the holy city. And this is the order in which the redeemed will stand around Christ at that time. It says, Now Christ again appears to the view of his enemies, page 665, Great Controversy. Far above the city, upon a foundation of burnished gold, are they thrown high and lifted up. Upon this throne sits the Son of God, and around him are the subjects of his kingdom. The power and majesty of Christ no language can describe, no pen portray. The glory of the Eternal Father is enshrouding his Son. The brightness of his presence fills the city of God and flows out beyond the gates, flooding the whole earth with its radiance. Nearest the throne are those who are zealous in the cause of Satan, but who, plucked as brands from the burning, have followed their Saviour with deep, intense devotion. Can you give me an example of that group of people? Like right, the Apostle Paul, the most obvious one on record. Next to those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity, those who honour the law of God when the Christian world made it void. Now who are they? The 144,000, right? The final generation upon this earth. Note the words again. Those who honoured the law of God when the Christian world declared it void. And then it says, and the millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond is the great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues before the throne before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands Revelation 7 verse 9 their warfare has ended their victory won so 
in the outside circle we find this great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Now that statement is not as clear as others, but it's one that uh, is quoted there in the great controversy to illustrate who that great multitude is. Now, if this great multitude is of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, it has to come from every generation in human history because there are peoples, such as the Amalekites, for instance, who have disappeared from the face of the earth. We don't find it in these, in these last days. Every possible nation is represented anymore. The Edomites have also disappeared in the face of the earth as well. And Esau is an Edomite and Esau will be in the kingdom. Uh, I just meant, uh, I think of Ishmael, right, my mistake there. Ishmael will be in the kingdom as Sister Wife says in Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, there is a problem though in, um, in verse, um, well we'll take verse 14 first of all and a bigger problem still in verse 15. Revelation chapter 7 And I said unto him Sir thou knowest Well verse 13 is a question And one of the elders answered Saying unto me What are these which are arrayed in white robes And whence came they And I said to him Sir thou knowest And he said to me These are they which came out of great tribulation And have washed their robes And made them white in the blood of the Lamb Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sits on the throne shall dwell amongst them they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more and so on now we could conclude from these two verses the following the expression these are they which came out of the great tribulation according to the most of reading is referring to the tribulation of Jacob's trouble which will be the most intense although the shortest of all human history that's one interpretation but there's another one equally valid and that is this that uh, the great tribulation has lasted the full span of human history from the fall of Adam to the second coming of Jesus Christ that is the great tribulation of which the other tribulations are only a part that's the second interpretation which that verse calls for now verse 15 says therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple now we know from early writings that the temple on Mount Zion can only be entered by whom? One for a thousand. So therefore people conclude these must be the one for a thousand. Otherwise, how could they serve in that temple? What is overlooked by these folk is the following. There are two temples up in heaven. One is the presence of God in the city and the other is Mount, a temple on Mount Zion outside the city. Let me just verify that from early writings in the same chapter read from before in the first vision given to Sister White. Um, I, I come across to... Um, well, I just have to run quickly over the paragraphs to, to put it all together. We all entered the cloud together and went to heaven. There we saw the tree of life. Uh, we went, went under the tree and ate of the fruit of it. Then we came down to this earth and uh, the city was established and then it says on page 18 um, then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city there I saw most glorious houses that had the appearance of silver supported by four pillars separate pearls most beautiful most glorious to behold these were to be inhabited by the saints then they crossed a field full of flowers we passed through the woods we were on our way to Mount Zion as we were travelling along we met a company who, who were also gazing at the glories of the place and they were martyrs I believe and um, then eventually they came to a temple on Mount Zion a considerable distance outside of the holy city and it says that as we were about to enter the holy temple Jesus raised his lovely voice and said only the one for the thousand enter this place and we shouted hallelujah so the temple referred to there into which only the one for a thousand goes outside the city on Mount Zion is not the temple inside the city where the throne of God is. But verse 15 makes it clear, Revelation 7, therefore are they before the throne of God. Now if they're before the throne of God, where are they? Out in Mount Zion or in the city? In the city where God's throne is. And they serve him day and night in his temple. So which temple must this be? Mount Zion or the one in the city? Right, in the city. That's very clear. So that text does not prove at all that they're the one for a thousand because all the redeemed will have access to God in that temple in the city 
right along. And my research on this question, and we did quite a lot on it at one stage because of the controversy about this chapter, is that, just to summarise, that there is a perfect relationship between the revelation of the one for the thousand and their sealing and the completion of their work. And immediately that work is done, then there comes to view the great multitude from all ages and nations which previously had been locked in their graves and they now come forth victorious before God and join with the one for the thousand to walk on the sea of glass. Very good, I hope. Let's uh, pass on now to the next question that takes care of the uh, one for the thousand uh, so far and all the questions on the one for the thousand. We come now to two questions in regard to the sin of Ham in respect to Noah when he, when he became drunk and uh, was in his tent uncovered. Let's turn back to the ninth chapter of Genesis to read the story and the consequent curse that was placed by Noah upon Ham and the blessing placed upon the other two brothers namely Shem and Japheth. Genesis chapter 9. And we start with verse 18. Genesis 9 and verse 18. And the sons of Noah that were went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah woke from his wine and knew, that, and, knew what his younger, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and he was 950 years when he died. So he would actually live longer than Adam did at 9.30, but not quite as long as Methuselah at 9.69. Now the question is, in what way did Ham look upon his father? Why was he cursed for seeing his father's nakedness? In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, we have some fine thoughts on this problem. And um, I read as follows on page 117 to 118 in Patriarchs and Prophets. To repopulate the desolate earth which the flood has so lately swept from its moral corruption God had preserved one family the household of Noah to whom he had declared thee have I seen righteous before me in, the, in this generation Genesis 7 verse 1 yet in the three sons of Noah was speedily developed the same great distinction seen in the world before the flood in Shem, Ham and Japheth who were to be the founders of the human race was foreshadowed the character of their posterity. Noah, speaking by divine inspiration, foretold the history of the three great races to spring from these fathers of mankind. Tracing the descendants of Ham to the, to the son rather than the father he declared, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. The unnatural crime of Ham declared that filial reverence had long before been cast from his soul and revealed the impiety and vileness of his character. These evil characteristics were perpetuated in Canaan and his posterity who continued, whose continued guilt called upon them the judgments of God. It wasn't so much that was bad enough that he looked upon the nakedness of his father, but his father had placed himself in a very embarrassing situation by becoming drunk and in this state he was lying in his tent apparently uncovered. And uh, uh, Ham looked upon his father and uh, thought the whole thing a rather lewd joke, something to be laughed and scoffed at. And this mental attitude upon his part revealed that in himself there was a disposition toward lewdness, toward immorality, toward laxity of, of morals and behaviour and so forth. 
And uh, as we shall read in just a moment, we're told that um, page 118 in the same book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the prophecy of Noah is no arbitrary denunciation of wrath or declaration of favour. He did not fix the character and destiny of his sons, but it showed what would be the result of the course of life they had severally chosen and the character they had developed. It was an expression of God's purpose toward them and their posterity in view of their own character and conduct. And this next sentence is very important. As a rule, as a rule, or according to law, children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents and imitate their example. What a responsibility parents have then to make sure that their dispositions and character are such as you'd love your children to have. And furthermore, they imitate your conduct. Um, right. So that the sins of the parents are practiced by the children from generation to generation. Thus the vileness and irreverence of Ham will reproduce this posterity, bringing a curse upon them for many generations. One sinner destroys much good. Now when Ham beheld the embarrassing condition of his father, he went out and talked this thing freely amongst the other inhabitants of the world which were his two brothers. There was no, um, there was no great multitude of people at this time. There were just the three boys and their wives and the father and the mother making eight souls all together. He went straight to his two brothers and told them what he'd seen. Now, it is the sacred obligation of members of the family to safeguard the reputation of other members of the family. If your brother or sister, your mother or father gets into trouble spiritually, morally or any other way um, and the re his, reputation or the, his or her reputation is in danger of being tarnished, is it, the, is it right for any other member of the family to go around the land adver advertising the sins of the other member of the family? Certainly not. Each member of the family should very sacredly protect the other members and keep the news or the information as closely guarded as possible. And is not the same thing true in the church today? Are we not a family of believers around the world? And should we not do our level best to safeguard the reputations of other people in the movement? Certainly. Did Ham do that? No, he didn't. If there had been 50 people living then, how many would he have told? At least most of them. And of course, that, that would guarantee the rest got to hear it anyway as the thing spread from tongue to tongue. So Ham's whole attitude toward his father in this situation was one of disrespect, of uh, looseness of morals, of lack of character, of um, immorality and selfishness. And as the statement says, the character and disposition of parents is transmitted to the children who also imitate their conduct. And therefore, the statement made by Noah under inspiration of the future life of Ham is a judgment on God's part, judgment in the sense of being an assessment or an awareness that, that the inheritance of Ham would pass down to Canaan from him to his, <coughs> his various children and that they would be reproduced in their offspring right down the line. Now the other two boys of course showed great respect in that, in that they refused to look upon their father's plight and walking in backwards they covered him with a robe until such time as he was able to, uh, to come back to his senses again and uh, resume normal activities. Now verse 24 says, Noah woke from his wine and knew that his younger son had done what his younger son had done unto him. And the question is, says, how did Noah know it was his uh, youngest son who, who saw him? Well, actually the Bible doesn't tell us neither does the spirit of prophecy. We can look at possibilities, but we can't know with certainty at the moment because as far as I know there's no actual revelation given. Of course I don't have my indexes and complete spirit of prophecy here to check this thing out exhaustively to see if somewhere perhaps it is mentioned as to how he did uh, come to know this, but the question of course can do this at home anyway. There are two possibilities. One, it may have been told to him by his wife or his daughters in law or by the, uh, one or two of, of the faithful sons. Maybe um, Ham continued to be loose-lipped about the business and even let the father know himself how he'd seen. That's, that's one pos those, are, those are possibilities. Another possibility, of course, is that the Holy Spirit of God may have informed him 
of this little scenario and thus he knew that his youngest son or rather his son Ham had done this to him so um, we're not quite sure of course how then the father did become informed of this but he certainly did become informed but we do know of course that the statement made about the three sons that Ham, Shem and Japheth was under inspiration and the inspiration was um, was um, by the Holy Spirit we've got a whole week's questions coming up here <laughs> um, ok that takes care of those questions I trust as I said before if you find any difficulties then when, when we get to the end of the study period you can ask as many questions as you wish to claim further clarification let's now start looking at these other questions as they've come up and I'll try and keep them in reasonable order so if we run out of time we'll be able to uh, now some people ask hard questions this one isn't the easiest I don't think the question is when Jesus returns the saints see a small black cloud in the east great God of 640 could this cloud appear black because Jesus is bearing the sins to place them on the scapegoat Satan or does this take place earlier or later sin is likened to a thick cloud well it's a very novel question I, I rather think it's an inter interesting one too I've never been faced with that one before now we're <laughs> We certainly can answer one part of the question, namely that um, the placing of the sins upon the scapegoat takes place when Jesus Christ actually comes back to this earth. And that's verified by the sanctuary service itself and supported by a statement in the Great Controversy which makes that point very, very plain. Now in the Great Controversy, I mean in the, in the sanctuary service, after the high priest had completed the cleansing of the sanctuary by making atonement in the most holy place and in the holy place he came out into the courtyard and in the courtyard in full view of Israel placed the sins upon the scapegoat now the general rule is that every event which took place in the courtyard is antityped by events which take place upon this earth in other words the cross the sacrifice of the lamb or the he goat or whatever it might happen to be took place in the courtyard of the sanctuary and where did the crucifixion of Christ take place? down here upon this earth the sacrifice of the lamb was witnessed by the people and likewise the people witnessed the death of Christ upon the cross whereas whatever events took place inside the sanctuary such as the sprinkling of the blood and so forth was not witnessed by the people and took place up in the heavenly sanctuary so then inasmuch as the laying of the sins upon the scapegoat in the Old Testament type took place in the courtyard in full view of the people then where must the laying of the sins of Satan take place? Down upon this earth in full view of whom? All the redeemed. And that is borne out very clearly in Great Controversy page 658 in the following words now the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the day of atonement when the ministration in the holy of holies had been completed and the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by, the, by virtue of the blood of the sin offering then the scapegoat was presented to lie before the Lord and in the presence of the congregation the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goats in like manner that, that was the Old Testament type so far now comes the, the New Testament and the type in like manner when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary is being completed then in the presence of God and the heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan he will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit and as the scapegoat was sent away into the land not inhabited so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth and uninhabited and dreary wilderness now the previous page talks about the coming of Jesus Christ his arrival down here upon this earth and after describing that then we have this declaration about where and when the sins will be placed upon the scapegoat so Jesus Christ does bring with him the sins of the, of the righteous to place them upon the scapegoat upon his arrival down here upon this earth that part of the question is easily answered the other part is worth thinking about but I, I can begin to see some problems involved in that because while the cloud at an immense distance appears to be black as I remember it now as it comes close according to early writings it becomes very beautiful and glorious and brilliant 
Whereas one would th think it would remain black until the sins have been taken away from it. Let's see now. Right. Page 15 in um, early writings. Soon our eyes were drawn to the east for a small black cloud that appeared about half as large as a man's hand, which we all knew was a sign of the Son of Man. We all in solemn silence gazed on the clouds that drew nearer and became lighter, glorious and still more glorious, till it was a great white cloud. The bottom appeared like fire, a rainbow was over the cloud and, and what around it were ten thousand angels singing a most lovely song and upon it sat the Son of Man. His hair was white and curly and lay on his shoulders and upon his head were many crowns. His feet had the appearance of fire and his right hand was a sharp sickle and his left a silver trumpet. And so it goes on. So um, while the cloud is black to begin with, it's at an immense distance. That cloud must be enormous in size because it will contain 10,000 times 10,000 thousands of angels plus all the redeemed that went up to heaven when Christ did. And 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million, isn't it? is it not? And that takes a lot of space to house 100 million people, each of whom will be at least 12 feet tall. So the cloud will be no, no pocket handkerchief size, nothing the size of which we've seen up in our skies today, and therefore be visible at an immense distance. So great it will appear to be a little black cloud, but as it draws near it will grow brighter and brighter until it becomes a great white cloud uh, with a base of fire and very beautiful and glorious. So I just wonder if uh, the suggestion that the blackness symbolizes the sin that Christ is carrying is really a, uh, a supportable one in this connection. I rather think it is not. Now, <clears throat> okay. mm -hmm. There's an interesting statement in Spiritual Gifts that I'll need you not to get the specifics, but I'd like you to comment on. She says that it takes time to leave the scapegoat away into the wilderness because he struggles violently, and should he break away, all of God's children would die. And it seems to me, she says, that that is taking place while the cloud is traveling from the, from the sanctuary to the east. Some curious and spiritual gifts from the Sporting McGann collection. No, that, I'll look it up for you. Okay. I'll get it. I think it's in spiritual gifts. Very good. Well, I'll wait till the statement comes. I'd like, I'd like to see it in that book, but uh, I, I know from the Sporting McGann collection. Okay, well, our time has gone for the study period. Uh, are there any questions you'd like to add on, add to what I've been talking about? Any points you, that you, are not clear? Or anyone has a better answer than I had? All right, let's, it's almost four o'clock. Let's come back at 15 minutes past. Promptly, please, and we'll continue at that point of time.